In this latest programme from Avison Ensemble TV, we visit the King's Hall at Newcastle University on the afternoon before a concert held on the 27th of September 2009, featuring the work of the Division Lobby. The Division Lobby brings the exhilaration of spontaneous music creation to the early music platform, with colourful and varied programmes consisting entirely of music in the 17th century Italian traditions. But it's not crossover or fusion. It's improvisation, pure and simple, transforming the 17th century musical sketches into dazzling virtuosic performances. In a moment, we'll meet the director of the division lobby, Paula Chateauneuf. But first, the development director for the Averson Ensemble, Francis Benton, was delighted at the collaboration of funders and the musicians in staging the concert. Um, our display here shows all the concerts that are coming in the 2009-10 season. We've got 27 events, all brought to us thankfully by those who sponsor us. The Arts Council, of course, is the top of the list for, for those who help us. But this particular concert comes from the Culture 10 group, which is part of the Newcastle Gateshead series of concerts this year. And we're delighted to have had special funding from them to make this possible, because bringing international musicians of this quality into the North East is of course a costly business so we're delighted to have had their help. It was part of the style then to add ornamentation to even music that was quite fleshed out, quite written down. Although what we're using are sketches which have very very little to go on, maybe just a few long notes over which um, you know a a keyboard player might improvise a solo or, an, or a melody instrument might do the same. So, for instance, one of the pieces we're doing has, it starts out with a triple section, which is kind of fairly written out, but they're still adding ornamentation in between all the written out notes. And then you get to a point where you just get a few chords. And that's when you really would go into a solo. You know, like for instance, a jazz sax player might do a solo on a chord progression. I mean, there was also a, a the quite a, there were quite a few um, stock chord progressions, which are called ground basses, which they all knew. They all had different names. We're doing a pasamezzo and a romanesca. There was also the bergamasca, conte colados, all sorts of things. And basically, they just knew these progressions, and they knew them well enough that they could create their own improvised pieces over these. <laughs> So you're doing the tuning here. I'm doing this. I'm just doing the tuning. This isn't a piece yet. <laughs> <laughs> and they're quite sensitive to temperature and humidity, partly because they've got lots of got strings on. So it's just checking. You're ready to give us a performance. Ready then. to give you a little performance. you actually nail down the performance then in rehearsal or when are you still adding bits when you're alive? Oh absolutely I mean the improvisation that's happening is different every time just about. Um, what we're nailing down are certain things like arrangements maybe who plays where and we're also still talking about things like if you're functioning as an accompanist rather than a soloist how you play, how you structure your accompaniment, um, so that we can really hear the difference between who's the soloist and who's the accompanist. Because of course, back then, accompanists used to primarily improvise over a bass line. There weren't a lot of accompaniments that were written down. So this is a very exciting process then for you as musicians. Isn't very, it? very exciting, yeah. yeah. I mean, we've had um, a series of rehearsals over the summer um, because of course you can't do this you can't rehearse this group like a normal group just say okay we'll get together a few days before I mean people need to learn the material if it's new to them get the chord progressions in their ears or the melodies in their ears and you know you need to have quite a few goes at just practicing in front of other people 
getting certain ideas of yours kind of fleshed out, see what works, what doesn't work, etc. Is it a style of music that lends itself to being recorded then? Because it just strikes me that because it is so alive and so variable, it almost kind of spoil. You, you, you can never actually record a performance of a piece and say that is the definitive piece, can you? Because you might play it again live next week and it would have changed slightly. Is that true? Yes, and I suppose that's the one drawback to recording is that there seems to be this idea that it should be one's definitive interpretation of something. But, I mean, again, um, you know, there are plenty of jazz recordings which are actually quite exciting. Um, and one can, of course, record what's there, and it's actually very useful to hear how it all sort of fits together and if it works, because there are some times when you'll have three or four people improvising together in, in this program, you know. And my original thought was, is, is this going to sound like chaos? Mm. But actually, amazingly, most of the time it doesn't. <laughs> and there are reports of chaos back then, too. 